one of the most prolific theologians in the 1900s was a man, a priest, whose name was Father Karl Rahner. He was a German and a Jesuit theologian. And probably in the prime of his life, he was writing and teaching as, uh, during this time of the Second Vatican Council, leading up to the Council and in the uh, years following the Second Vatican Council. He was actually appointed as an advisor to uh, the Second Vatican Council. A lot of the bishops and cardinals who were at the Council had somebody who was there to help them, you know, or a couple of people to help them. So he was one of the people who was appointed uh, to help with, the theolo- with um, all the different things being discussed and so forth at the Second Vatican Council. So Father Karl Rahner. And so he put forth many things, had a, had a lot to say, him and Pope Benedict, actually, both Germans uh, who were there as advisors who had a big impact uh, probably on the council itself, even though they were uh, basically kind of the equivalent of secretaries or appointees uh, to the council. So Father Rahner had, had lots of uh, things, that uh, teachings and so forth, that were accepted or incorporated or weaved into the Second Vatican Council. One of the ideas, though, that was um, that, of Father Rahner's, which was rejected, and it's not like it's, you know, ooh, burn, he got rejected, you know, by the council, uh, so much as theologians are people who are kind of always looking for new ideas, new ways to propose things, new ways to teach things. And then when you propose those things, it's kind of like, hey, you're, you're asking for input. What do, you, what, is, what do you other theologians think about this? What do other bishops, priests, etc.? And so some of the, those things are accepted, and that's happened through the, through the centuries, right? I mean, people put forth ideas. Other people, we, okay, let's think about that, and they talk it through. So it's not like it was this big, you know, rejection of, of Father Rahner, but it's important, I think, and it's related to today is why I mention this. And so one of the ideas that, that Father Rahner had in his, in his one of the theolo- theological ideas that was rejected by the Second Vatican Council ultimately was based on the fourth chapter of John, where Jesus is engaging in a conversation with a Samaritan woman who is not, obviously, a Jewish woman. And Jesus tells her that there will be one day where people will worship in spirit and in truth. One day, people will worship in spirit and in truth. And so Father Rahner kind of theologized and wondered, you know, maybe that what that means, maybe what Jesus was saying is sort of this idea that, you know, God is everywhere. And so, not that we don't need to go to church anymore, he wasn't saying that, but this idea that, that the sacred is, is something that kind of is found everywhere, that we can always find the sacred in everything. And so, this idea where we talk about the church being a sacred building and a sacred place is maybe Father Rahner was sort of suggesting that maybe that's not so much the case. Maybe that the, the, the church building and the sacraments and so forth, which we consider to be uh, the ultimate form of the sacred, you know, maybe, maybe that's not as much, maybe the difference isn't as strong as we have thought in the past as Catholics. And again, the Second Vatican Council uh, rejected that notion and instead um, says something very important in one of its pillar documents. And I wanted to just share that quote with you. The Second Vatican Council, every liturgical celebration is a sacred action surpassing all others. So any celebration of the sacraments, particularly the Mass, the Second Vatican Council says is a sacred action, and that's a beautiful word, surpassing all others. So the Second Vatican Council, kind of in contradiction to Father Rahner, is saying what we do here at the Mass is the most sacred thing you can possibly do. You can't, it it surpasses. So again, the church wasn't saying that you can't encounter anything sacred once you leave the doors of your church. The church wasn't saying, you know, isn't saying at the Second Vatican Council that, well, you know, you, you can't find God anywhere else but here. No, the church wasn't saying that. It's just saying that this is the most sacred thing we can do. And because of that, then this place is a sacred place, a sacred space that we have here in our church and everything that we do here. So it's it's more sacred. So yes, I can in the rectory. I can say my prayers and I can find God there. I can find God in the woods and pray to God in the woods and at McDonald's and everywhere else that I'm at. God is everywhere. But he's, every, he's not everywhere in the same way as what we believe as Catholic. We find God most present and most eminent here in the celebration of the Mass and in the celebration of the sacraments. 
That's really important for us. And, and then the reason I bring all this up is to say that the wise men illustrate this in a very beautiful way. And I think that we find this in the gospel reading in just one verse. We find so much of this illustrated. And I wanted to just reflect on that. In the wise men, we read today in the gospel that on entering the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They prostrated themselves and did him homage. And they offered their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I see three major takeaways based on this whole idea of the Second Vatican Council and what we've always believed as Catholics, that this is a sacred space, that this is more sacred than other spaces that we have, that what we do at Mass is the most sacred thing that we can do. First of all, it says that the wise men, on entering the house, on entering the house, they didn't, you know, what they could have done was say, okay, we see the star, it looks like there's a king coming, really good guy, maybe the Messiah, We'll worship him here, and then we won't have to travel anywhere, right? But experts, theologians suggest that the, that the wise men traveled a year or maybe even two years to get to Jesus. So I know, like, I have a half-hour drive after this to my next Mass, right? And sometimes I'm like, wow, that's kind of far. That's not a year. The wise men had to travel a year to find the Christ child, or two, Right? They didn't just say, well, you know what? We can pray in the woods. We can pray in our huts. We can pray in our palace, whatever they had. No, they said, we need to go to the house. We need to go to be in the presence of the king. And they went at great cost and great expense and great time on their own. And so I know sometimes, again, we think, well, I have a long way to go, or maybe I don't necessarily need to go to the house of the Lord. Maybe I don't necessarily need to go to the church to find God. And you don't have to go to the church to find God. But what happens and what we believe is that this is where God dwells most near to us. And that's why we are asked and taught by the church to come to Mass every Sunday and Holy Day. And why we believe that this place is a sacred space. The second thing that we see from the wise men is it says that they prostrated themselves and did him homage. That means they laid face first on the, on the floor, probably dirt. Kings, in their robes or whatever they were wearing, fancy clothing, laying face first in the dirt before the Christ child. And that's why we do all these things of genuflecting and kneeling and all these other signs of, of of recognition of the presence of the king. You're welcome to lay on the floor face first, although you don't have to, right? Thankfully, the church just says, we genuflect and we show these signs of reverence. But again, I think we see something in that sign of reverence from these wise men that reminds us and is exactly what we are doing here when we come into this place and when we celebrate the Mass. We, too, worship Christ and do the king homage and offer ourselves. Sometimes people say, you know, well, we're here for community, we're here as for, for all these other things, but the church has always said that the first and primary reason that we are here is to come together at Mass to do the King of Kings homage and to praise Him. And all the things that come out of this, our parish life, our community, the experiences of friendship and the relationships that we build here, it all flows from the primary thing that we are here for first, which is to come and do the King of Kings homage and praise. If we don't have that as our first reason, then nothing else will go right. All the other things that we might be here for, will not, we will not find them if we are not here first and foremost to offer praise and thanks to our Lord. And then the final takeaway that I think we can see from the wise men in their story is that what they did upon entering the sacred space, doing the Lord homage, they then offer the Lord their very best. They offer their, their sacrifices, and that's why we too offer our very best. That's why we're restoring our church, and we're constantly maintaining it and treating this place in a sacred way. And we believe that this is a place that must reflect the presence of God being here. We, like the kings, and we offer what we have as well, and we give our very best to our Lord. And that's what we're doing here in our church today 
and as we do our restoration, etc., and continue to do that throughout the year. We offer and maintain this place so that others who come will say, these people must believe that something special is happening here, that there is something that is more sacred here than it is in their homes, than there is in the woods, than there is at McDonald's. Nothing against McDonald's. We are here today at this, in this sacred place, in this sacred space, participating in a sacred action that surpasses everything else that we could possibly do. May we believe that. And may others who visit us and participate with us, may they be moved by joining us and recognizing that what we are doing here is the most holy and most sacred thing we can possibly do on this side of heaven.